Hello everyone. Welcome to the first Politics in a Pint of the school year. I'm Maya Hermerding. I work at the McCarthy Center as a student coordinator. I'm excited to see you all here. We're going to have a great conversation. But before we get started, I'm going to turn the mic over to Grace from Fine Arts Programming. She has something that she'd like to talk to you about. Hi everyone, I'm Grace Davidson. I am the Campus Outreach Manager for Fine Arts Programming. I just wanted to let you know that we have our mobile box office right outside, so afterwards stop by, grab a program, talk to them. And this weekend we have a really awesome show, Muka Paza. It's like a marching band that plays rock music. It's going to be really fun and we'd love to see you all there. Thank you so much and enjoy your night. Thanks, Grace. Okay, so our present. There we go. Tonight are uh, Dr. Philip Cronabush and Dr. Claire Haig. They're both from the Political Science Department. Um, Dr. Cronabush teaches Courts Law and Policy, Constitutional Law 1 and 2, and Dr. Haig teaches, I'm only giving you a brief taste of what they teach, uh, oh gee, Polls 111, Intro to U.S. Politics, um, Congress, uh, Presidency, and they both are leaders of our Capstone Town Campus. So tonight, we are here to learn from them about, really, can he do that? Executive power as provided by the Constitution, because as you know, we're celebrating Constitution Day here on campus. Hi, my name's uh, Claire Haig, I'm the, uh, and I'm here kind of to represent this uh, separation of powers aspect of the Constitution, because it is, after all, Constitution Day. But I did want to, um, so I'm going to hand over to Phil fairly quickly. So I have a couple, but I ha wanted to uh, cover a couple of things that I think are interesting from the Congress point of view. So the uh, basic questions that um, we have about uh, separation of powers are can Will Congress respond to presidential power or presidential overreach, and in what ways can they do that? So Congress can respond in several ways, one of which is impeachment, which we can talk about if you have questions about it, and the other um, major way that Congress responds is just by passing legislation. Um, and uh, there's several pieces of legislation, one in particular, which was the sanctions, uh, Russian Sanctions Act, um, which, in which Congress overwhelmingly passed um, an act which codified um, and put into law some sanctions that had been passed by uh, President Obama on Russia um, in response to Russia meddling in the 2016 election. And Congress responded to Trump's um, seeming willingness to um, go nice on Russia again or, and relieve those sanctions by putting them into law. And they did so with only five members of Congress disagreeing with that. So only five members of Congress voted against that act. Um, so that's sort of one important way in which Congress can respond to presidential power. Um, and the other is impeachment. But I, I'll leave that till later and I'll ask Phil to talk about specifically the constitutional constraints on executive power. Hi, everyone. Well, let me just begin and see whether this microphone comes on or not. I have to hold it closer. Ah, thank you. OK, let me begin by talking a little bit about the history of this odd little event called Constitution Day, which you probably have not been celebrating in your life. Actual Constitution Day is uh, September 17th. But the reason we're conducting this is in part inspired by a couple of decades ago, there was a longtime member of the US Senate named Robert Byrd. And he loved the US Constitution, and he was distressed to hear how little about the US Constitution American college students knew. So he uh, uh, proposed an amendment to a piece of legislation in Congress requiring all colleges to have a uh, event noting the US Constitution sometime in September. And this actually remains a law. I'm convinced lots of colleges ignore it, but we're, we comply with federal law here, so this is our Constitution Day commemoration event. So I really want to turn things over a lot to your questions. I teach constitutional law. It's a fascinating document, tons of complexity. 
and really what we're talking about here in some ways is I think the most important clauses of the US Constitution are the first sentence of Article 1, the first of Article 2, and the first of Article 3. And those sentences are, all legislative power shall be vested in a Congress. Article 2, all executive power shall be vested in a president. And Article 3 begins, all uh, judicial, did I just misspeak? All executive power shall be vested in a president. And Article 3, all judicial power shall be vested in a judiciary. So really, when we're addressing this question, what can Trump do? We're, we're addressing that question of what are those powers the president has under this grant of executive power? And the answer is he can do a lot. And that's what we're learning. And I just jotted down lots of subject areas in case you want to want to get into them. So the travel ban, what we call the travel ban was an executive order that Trump issued, so it did not have the participation of Congress at all. DACA was a, uh, you know, originally an Obama executive order that then Trump is in a way withdrawing. The firing of the FBI director Comey is then part of his executive power to then fire uh, the FBI head. The Trump administration is fundamentally changing how colleges administer Title IX sexual assault uh, hearings. Uh, Trump has issued this transgender ban of the military. Uh, it, he has pardoned uh, the former sheriff of Phoenix. Uh, he's dealt with these sanctuary cities issues. And then also as president, he has taken a side in the Supreme Court case dealing with a bakery owner in Colorado that has refused to bake wedding cakes for gay couples. So that sounds like it's a legal case, but it's a case that then the president's uh, sol acting solicitor general has filed a brief supporting that bakery shop owner. So in a way, I want to say, take it away, what do you want to talk about? I'd like to talk about the one you brought up last. Um, so, this amicus, so this amicus briefing that uh, Donald Trump and Jeff Sessions have just filed with the Supreme, with the Supreme Court has it like historically made a difference to the to like the outcome of cases like this? If what side the U.S. government is arguing on, will this like will this amicus briefing change the potential outcome of this case? Okay, who here is in my research seminar class? Oh man, they are so in trouble. <laughs> wait, wait. Oh, Maya, Maya. The answer is yes. Yes. Absolutely, we political scientists know some things for certain. And the most influential uh, filer of amicus briefs is the Solicitor General the, 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 who takes the President's position on this issue. And those briefs are, we are positive, are influential on the Supreme Court's decision. Now, it doesn't absolutely determine uh, 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 the decision, but there is no influence more powerful than the Solicitor General's uh, brief in a case like that. And the Trump administration has then said that the bakery shop owners' rights of First Amendment free expression have to be protected. So the baking of a cake, I'm just trying to, this is the President's argument, I'm not making fun of it here, I'm just trying to lay it out, the baking of a cake for a wedding is, an, is, a, is free expression that is protected by the First Amendment against Colorado's anti-discrimination law. That's the argument. So those are some things he can do. What are, would be some things he couldn't do? What would be outside of the presidential powers? Well, 
Well, I'll answer that in a, a particular way. Like, in what what ways can Congress, and I guess Phil can talk about what the Supreme Court could do too. Um, in what ways can Congress imp uh, impede presidential activity? And the answer is quite a lot. Um, in part because they have the power of the purse. So if they really wanted to, they could pass uh, a budget which uh, doesn't do what he wants. And in fact, they kind of did that already in um, when they passed a budget back in May. Um, is that right, DC people? Were you there when they passed the budget? So they passed a continuing resolution basically to get us through September um, and they did not fund the wall. They refused. And they did not defund um, the National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities. So there's clear things, ways in which Congress has its own priorities and can constrain activity by the president. Um, they can do it better in the long term, and they can do it better in domestic policy than they can in foreign policy. Um, and because he tends to have this power as commander in chief that wins, um, but really they can um, not do things. He can say, hey, pass that Health Care Act, and Congress can fail to do that because uh, there are senators in there who might not like it. So there you go. So there's lots of things that Congress has responses to the presidency, uh, the president's acting if they want to. I have to then quickly add, as I think everyone then recognized, recognizes that Congress is controlled by Republicans, both the House and the Senate. So how likely are they to oppose Trump? That's the, we have to see over time uh, 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 perspective. The other critical issue is, of course, the president can either sign or veto anything passed by Congress at this point. So if Con the House and Senate could, by majority vote, pass new legislation controlling the president, but Trump will veto it if he opposes it. Now, then, as everyone knows from their high, ninth grade civics class, then both houses of Congress can then override the veto by a two-thirds vote, but that's the same thing as saying when hell freezes over, given the modern political climate. Yeah, in fact, it won't happen because the Republicans have both House and Senate, so it, there is a lot of constraint. On the other hand, which is why I mentioned the Russian sanctions bill, which many of you may have totally ignored, but which is a big deal for political scientists, in part because it is Congress, which is both chambers are controlled by Republicans constraining the activities of the president for particular reasons. And, and it's a, a almost unanimous vote from both chambers that comes back and says, yeah, but we're not going to let President Trump uh, do this foreign policy thing of, you know, allowing, uh, giving back some, um, I think there were some houses that the Russians lost use of and we're not going to let him do that. He can't do anything. These Russian sanctions are going to stay in place. So is that was actually the reason that I talk about it so much is it's totally surprising because it almost never happens. Republicans will vote with a Republican president and um, and it's very hard to get a veto proof majority. So So you mentioned the pardon of Sheriff uh, Arpaio, and the Constitution doesn't put any particular restrictions on the power of pardon, but it, the, the, in that case, the pardon is interesting in that it's the only pardon that I know of. Most pardons, it is, I've, I've learned my lesson, I'm sorry for what I did. In this case, it seems that the pardon is sending the message to legalize what Sheriff Arpaio did. He, he deprived people of the civil rights, and then he ignored a court order uh, directing him to stop uh, depriving people of their civil rights. So in effect, Trump's pardon of Arpaio is like saying, I am legalizing what you were convicted of. 
Is that stretching the pardon power in your view? See, here's our great kind of Constitution Day moment where is is the yes exactly is the pardon bad is was Trump's pardon here bad yes is it in violation of the constitution no so and i think there's lots of things that are in that category which is the as as professor reed then uh, recognized the the constitution's pardoning power on my reading is pretty unchallengeable. The president simply has that power. There's no way I can imagine a challenge to the use of that power. Now, you may even extend this a little bit and, and try the, well, could Trump pardon himself? And the answer to that, see, that's like this really hard question because the Constitution does not forbid it. If you ask James Madison, should the president have the power to do that, he'd say, oh, oh no, 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 that, let's write that in the Constitution right now. But they didn't. So the pardoning power is, I think, <clears throat> unchallengeable. That's my read. And my addendum to that would be, constitutionally, yes. But do you get punished for that? Um, I don't think so in this case, but certainly Gerald Ford, President Ford found that he, that at least many political observers would have said, oh, that when Gerald Ford pardoned President Nixon, um, that was he had that had consequences for him electorally. So if there there may be an electoral consequence for, say, pardoning yourself if you're President Trump, um, I'm not sure that this one is going to do anything uh, electorally because I think his base liked it. His base wanted it and his base liked it. Hello. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, the president's ability or inability to fire special prosecutor Robert Mueller, because I know that's been in the news a lot lately. Can he do it? Can't he do it? Um, is that within the parameters of his constitutional power or not? I say for sure, yes. He has the constitutional power to do so. Um, and people recall... And the students of history know that this has been an absolutely key event in Richard Nixon's presidency and the Watergate investigation, which is that there was a Watergate special prosecutor, Archibald Cox, and Richard Nixon ordered his attorney general to fire Archibald Cox. The attorney general refused and resigned. The deputy attorney general refused and resigned and then the third ranking person in the Justice Department then agreed, complied with what Nixon ordered him to do. And just it, this fits with what uh, Professor Haig was saying, that legally Nixon could fire Archibald Cox. I think that's not challengeable. But then did that cause, did that help trigger the collapse in support for Richard Nixon? Absolutely, yes. That it was on all accounts than a precipitating event to the collapse of support for Richard Nixon that eventually led to his imminent impeachment, but then his resignation essentially days before he would have been impeached. So he, can he has the constitutional, I like Megan's phrasing, yes, he has the constitutional power to fire Comey, but can he get away with it? That's a whole different political issue. Um, since you brought up Nixon and Watergate, I was wondering, so in the past we've seen uh, congressional subcommittees form in response to pr pr presidential executive power overreach. What potential committees do you think we could see coming out of the Trump administration era in Congress in the future to like in response to any potential perceived o overreach by the president. Yeah, that's yours. Oh. 
Oh, we have, right. Oh, okay. So Congress will always respond to uh, overreach by um, a president of the opposite party of the majority um, by loudly complaining about it and doing oversight. Um, so there are, there are many committees right now that are uh, engaged in oversight of um, the election and Russian involvement in the election and looking at the Trump campaign's involvement in that. So Congress is actually involved, has actually committees engaged in this. Um, uh, most of them are standing committees, not ad, ad hoc committees. Um, they will respond to Congress, however, and the majority will respond politically to political issues. So there's always going to be a political reason to hold a committee. Um, so if there's, well, as Phil pointed out, the sanctuary cities. So if there are sanctuary cities responding, um, if, there's, if the Congress wants to take on the issue of sanctuary cities, they will hold a congressional investigation about that. Um, but it is not as though they're not already doing certain things about presidential power. They're engaged in that already. Do you want to talk about things? Hold on. Hold on. I also have a question. Um, so kind of piggybacking off of the uh, sanctuary city issue, moving towards federalism and the interaction between the federal government and the states, um, President Trump last year ordered local police to work with ICE agents in order to remove non or undocumented immigrants from the United States. Is that executive overreach? Does he have the right to do that? And where does it come from if he does? You know, this is, it does, it, this dovetails with the DACA issue too, which has been kind of, in some ways, kind of complicated to follow. Because let me then kind of sketch out this history a little bit. So, what Obama issued, the original DACA order, was an exercise of what we would call his prosecutorial discretion. Now this is an odd little category to think about, but, and many people don't realize it, but the federal government doesn't enforce all of its laws all of the time. That's essentially impossible. It would take all too many resources. So what President Obama said is, okay, I'm the chief executive Prosecutorial power is an executive power, so I'm directing all prosecutors in the federal government not to pursue deportation against the following people. And then, he, as then ev I think everyone knows, uh, he then defined this group of people as uh, people who came to the United States illegally in an undocumented way, but as children. So they were, as it were, not violating the law. Perhaps their parents were violating the law, but they were children brought into the United States. So what President Obama said is, the federal government will not be acting to remove uh, any of uh, any DACA children uh, while I'm president. So essentially what now Trump has done is he said, I am now withdrawing that DACA order. So now essentially the deportable status for these children of undocumented immigrants is now, you know, they now become deportable again. Um, so it's essentially an exercise of, of executive power and the, the subcategory that's really prosecutorial discretion. Now, is he limited? The quick answer is maybe yes, and there are some state attorneys general have filed lawsuits saying that even though the president has this prosecutorial discretion, still the president has to follow the Constitution. And the Constitution includes the 14th Amendment, which says that all persons have rights to life, liberty, and property, and to the equal protection of the law. So, see, Trump can't violate that. 
And if you're sort of saying, okay, wait a minute, but these people aren't citizens, they don't have 14th Amendment rights, that's completely wrong because the 14th Amendment clearly says persons, not citizens. So Trump, Trump's new order is being challenged because it now treats uh, DACA eligible people uh, differently. It's in some ways deprived them of a liberty. So that's how now states' attorneys generals have now said Trump is violating the 14th Amendment by now withdrawing the DACA protection. Do you see how complicated that got? But see, that's really, that's what makes these issues kind of difficult and sort of like why all of you should be taking political science classes because, see, this is a really important issue, but it, it turns on these really odd machinations between Obama's order, Trump's order, the 14th Amendment, um, and then the state attorney general response to protect these citizen rights, these non-citizen, but these personal rights. Just as a quick addendum to that one, too, on a practical, well, Congress hasn't funded it yet, you also see issues um, in terms of DACA because uh, if you're going to deport, there's a political issue of deporting a whole bunch of, like, highly, you know, on a PR way, very attractive people, these young people that people have sympathy for, and sort of deporting them. The other issue is there is not enough funding for uh, immigration courts that they have huge backlogs that go back, I think they have six years. I think if you get picked up in Arizona um, for, and, and tagged with deportation, you have to wait six years to get deported even. So there's a huge backlog. I, uh, there's um, 600,000 uh, people in the pipeline and not enough, and I think only 200, is that right? 200 judges hearing these cases. So in terms of the Constitution, if you have, and you're legally, you know, the government must put everyone through these courts, then Congress has to fund it much better than it does, and it's not doing it, so. Kind of changing gears from that, uh, I think it was a couple of days ago I saw that, probably through Judge Report, that um, Trump ordered a, the drafting of an executive order stopping all trade with countries that work with North Korea, <clears throat> which includes China. So we know there's the interstate commerce clause, but who judges international commerce? You know, that's, that's a really good question, and I don't know what congressional statute would authorize that, but I believe that power does exist that it's sort of a kind of war-like power that, that I think we accept as uh, the president having to, to sort of impose a trade embargo with another country. So essentially that's what it would be. And I think no one has ever thought of this as sort of like something a president would ever sort of casually use in an ordinary policy-making way. In other words, a trade in, an absolute trade embargo is, is itself, I believe, it's either an act of war or close to an act of war. But we do, it's a very good question because we haven't even been talking about the president's power as commander in chief is very, very broad and very difficult to challenge. Because we can talk about all the issues we've been talking about so far, and then we could actually like go in some ways even farther and say, well, could the president order a nuclear attack that leads to the deaths of millions of people? The answer is unequivocally yes. So he for sure has that power. Now, are we really, really uncomfortable with the president having that power? Yes, but he for sure has it. So I believe he does have the power to impose trade embargoes on countries I, I, that's probably a bad path to follow with respect to China. It may be economically disastrous, but I suspect he does have that power. See, are we getting too depressing here? Yeah. <laughs>
Hey, there's more bear. <laughs> they were pre-depressed. <laughs> um, I do have to say, though, it, the problem with these sorts of war powers is that they have very short-term effects. So we talk about the two presidencies. The presidency is very powerful in the short term and in foreign policy. And this is a foreign policy. There's less power over the long term because con uh, Congress does have power to act to enforce things like trade treaties, right? So if there's a treaty that, you know, then this, you know, Congress can come in and, and attempt to um, force the president uh, to do certain things to, you know, or you have to, to do this in the same way as it did the Russian sanctions bill. And I would suggest that there's enough um, corporations like who would turn up to convince um, set the Senate to act if they couldn't convince the president to act to um, stop trade with, um, I mean, yeah, where are we going to get our iPhones if we don't trade with China, right? So there's, there's all sorts of things that um, might happen before that executive action goes into, a, into effect. But yeah, he does have that sort of level of power in foreign policy. Turning from wars to hotels, what's the emoluments clause and can he do that? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I will read the emoluments clause. <clears throat> no, uh, let's see. I have a better way to find it. Um, well, let me just ask. Well, here it is. It's 49 words. No title of nobility shall be granted by the United States. OK, we're good with that, right? And no person holding any office of profit or trust under the United States shall, without the consent of Congress, accept any present emolument office or title of any kind, whatever, from any king, prince, or foreign state. Now, people have been talking about this because the Trump Hotel exists in Washington, D.C., and foreign governments are then renting rooms in the Trump Hotel. So now does this violate the emoluments clause? Is Donald Trump accepting money from a foreign government in violation of the Constitution? We don't know whether this violates the emoluments clause or not, but now let me add, there's probably no way to conceptualize a court case that will raise this issue. So, neat issue, but when we study constitutional and court issues, you sometimes encounter issues that probably, it's definitely constitutional language, but how, who could raise a case to litigate this? And we don't know who, so it may be in a kind of an unenforceable clause of the Constitution. There is, of course, Congress. And part of the Russia investigation in various committees um, through the Congress, both on the House and Senate side, are looking into this. Um, they're not looking very hard, in part because all of the committees are controlled by Republicans. And it doesn't it doesn't they're not going to take down a senate a president of their own party that's not how parties work so um, they may might act to constrain that president and they have um, but they're not going to act to unseat that president um, I think um, all of the political science sort of indicates that unless the president becomes much more unpopular than he is right now um, they, the Republican Party will not move to remove the president from office. He'll have to be down in the 20s in terms of um, his support, certainly among Republicans, in order for Republicans to move to remove him from office. Um, if, the, uh, if the Democrats, through some, uh, in 2018, um, in the unlikely event that they take back the Senate, 
or um, they become a majority in the House, the, the Democratic chamber might move to uh, subpoena, you know, do things to make to on the emoluments clause question, um, but because the, the Congress can do those sorts of things, um, but right now they're not going to do that because the Republicans control that chamber, both chambers. But still, we're all really happy. It's okay. <laughs> Hello again. Um, so I was wondering if you could comment like a little bit on the kind of attacks the president has made on members of his both parties, including his party, and like what electoral cost that might have. Just because, I don't know, and he's been, I don't know. We'll see what, yeah, you do with that. I defer to Claire on that because no constitutional issue is raised. This is true. Um, it is odd to have a president make personal attacks of the Senate majority leader um, of his own party. Uh, so it is, but it is kind of a symptom of um, sort of the personality politics of this president, which are non-typical. I'm just going to call it non-typical. Um, so that is odd, um, and the fact that he is now um, cozying up to. Chuck and Nancy, uh, which is, of course, um, the minority uh, leader in the House, uh, Nancy Pelosi, and the um, uh, minority leader in the Senate, um, Chuck Schumer. So uh, this seems to be something that President Obama referred to as he's non-ideological, he's highly pragmatic. I think this is what President Obama was referring to. Um, that he will do things in his own interest, not necessarily in the Republican Party's interest. Um, and I think the Republican Party knows some of this and will respond accordingly. Um, it doesn't seem to be hurting him with his base. So he still has 80% of Republicans and more of the people who voted for him, a surprising number, um, are still supportive of the president. Uh, they are less supportive of the Republicans in Congress. They blame, they still blame the Republicans, in, the Republican Congress for not passing health care reform. They don't blame um, President Trump. Um, so, so far, the president is not facing any electoral consequences himself. I think your question, however, was are the Republicans going to face electoral consequences, right? Hmm, depends on the you know, of course, McCain's not going to face any electoral consequences because he's not going to face an election again, you know, so he's not up for election. It really does depend. Um, probably not in a general election. There may be primaries that happen that will be really interesting to see. So there may be some primary elections where a more hardline conservative is voted in in place of um, a more moderate Republican. We'll see. What are some positive things that you see coming out of the current political cycle that we're in? Uh, I can't think of any. I was hoping you were going to. Um, okay, here's my positive. My positive is a whole bunch of young people are now engaged in politics, really engaged. And I don't think we saw that 10 years ago. I think that I, it is possible that the young generation will start voting in the, at the levels that um, you know, the New Deal generation voted at. So that, that sort of increased voting, um, increased engagement, um, the number of young women running for office in the next election cycle is at record levels already. So that's a hopeful thing. You know, we need women to run, please consider it. Um, the number of people who are just Democrats running for office, like we have a lot of 
uncontested elect, um, elections out there, and so it's awesome that people are stepping up and, and running for office. So there you go. That's my hopeful sign, is an engaged electorate. I think that's good for everyone, whether whichever side of the aisle you sit on and wherever you lie on the political spectrum, that's got to be a hopeful thing. Ah, speaking of more hopeful topics, um, or at least more fun and lighthearted, what's your favorite part about the Constitution? I have to let Claire go first so I can think more carefully. The chip shot is the 19th Amendment, of course. My favorite part of the Constitution. Um, yeah, I think that I'll go with 19th Amendment, but and then I'll give Phil a chance to talk. Okay, so the 19th Amendment, by the way, um, is uh, gave women the right to vote. Uh, in 1920, and uh, so that's probably my uh, favorite part, but I recognize that it's not necessarily the most important part, so I'm going to change the question and ask Phil what the most important part of the Constitution is. <clears throat> well, I've already given the answer to that, because that's the, it's the first sentence of the first three articles that I already went through. Now, is it too cheeky to say the 21st Amendment? Because that's the repeal of prohibition. <laughs> We're in Brother Willis Pub. Maybe, I, maybe I shouldn't even joke about that. Um, you know, overall, the Fourteenth Amendment. Yeah, you know, it's it's an overachieving amendment, meaning it's like done. There are some amendments I I count as underachieving amendments, like the Eleventh Amendment, like. None of you know what that amendment is. See, that's the point. That the 14th Amendment, though, a, a rich source of thousands of Supreme Court cases. So yay, 14th Amendment. Hello. So obviously the Constitution is a very large, very complex document. But if you had to pick, what would you say is your favorite part of the Constitution? So Claire's sticking with 19th Amendment, and um, I'm just sticking with 14th Amendment for favorite, too. So most important and favorite. Yeah, we're going to start. Call we're going to start calling on people. I also encourage yeah, yeah questions from non-polls students. Yes. Go ahead, come on up. Okay. Um, given the president's removal of uh, some top tier people in the past, for example, um, FBI Director James Comey, uh, former Attorney General, General Loretta Lynch, um, is there any chance of something such as the Tenure of Office Act being brought back? Because I know that the president has the power um, to a point, but then obviously um, top level members need to be approved by Congress. But there's no rule um, that says that the removal of the same person or the same person getting um, that doesn't need Congress approval or Senate approval, I should say. Is there what is the justification behind that? The fact that Senate approval is needed for the appointment or for the instation of uh, nominee, but not the removal of one. Okay, I have to ask a follow up question though. Where is this coming from? Because you, have you taken constitutional law? Okay. No one talks about the Tenure of Office Act unless they've taken constitutional law. So where is this coming from? High school, basically. Uh, so we did a march around high school on the um, impeachment trial. Ah, okay. See, this is a really wonky constitutional law question, which is to say I love it. <laughs> but the answer turns on the following, and there have been multiple Supreme Court cases on this, which is 
if the office exercises purely executive power, Congress cannot restrict the president's removal power. That's why James Comey, as FBI director, is exercising executive power. Robert Mueller, investigating Trump, is exercising executive power. They're both, for sure, removable by the president. However, if the official exercises any, and this is the exact Supreme Court language, quasi-legislative, quasi-judicial power, then Congress can restrict the president's removal power. But that only then applies to things like the Federal Elections Commission is seen as exercising quasi-judicial power, quasi-legislative power, so Congress can restrict the president's removal power of those officials. But Congress cannot restrict the president's removal power for any official exercising purely executive powers. C, this is why you want to take constitutional law or maybe proof that you don't want to. But Andrew Johnson was impeached over exactly this issue, but the Supreme Court has ruled since then on this identical issue. Okay, we're calling on people next. Emily Burke. <laughs> <laughs> Emily's friend, Hannah. See, that's what you get from meeting me before this. My question is also related to the emoluments clause, which we talked about a little bit so far. But um, one thing that uh, I've seen people jump to and cling to is this idea that Trump never um, divulged himself from his businesses, and including not just his hotels. Um, so he placed them in a blind trust, if I'm remembering oh, no, correctly. No, no, no? Correction, not no? a blind trust. No. See, okay. other presidents have put their assets in a blind trust. Okay. And blind trust means that then the president doesn't know what he owns and doesn't own. That's the definition of a blind trust. Someone else administers it. Trump made a big deal out of signing over day-to-day -day operations to his sons, but Donald Trump knows what he owns, and his sons control them. So a different thing. Sorry, Danny, I had to jump in. Well, thank you for the correction then. So um, what constitutional guideline, if any, is given to that? Is that a standard best practice that's been considered um, as something that presidents have done out of respect for uh, the office to place assets in a blind trust? as well as the presence of Ivanka Trump in the White House as a businesswoman uh, who has an advisory role of some sort and is a family member, um, but is also a businesswoman at the same time with her own private interests, um, being in the presence of the Oval Office on a daily basis to our understanding. So uh, any constitutional guideline on any of those issues, emoluments clause or not? See, this, this has been fascinating, and I've learned something myself with this. I thought the president was required to put things in a blind trust, but it turns out to have been a tradition that has developed and all presidents have followed for 30 some years now. But it is not a law, and I learned that myself as Trump became president. So there, it has never been a legal requirement, it has only been a tradition that has developed and Trump is violating that tradition but it is not a legal violation. You'll notice that some other members of the, most other members of the executive branch leadership do have to do that. They are required, um, and you, that's part of the problem that uh, the president has had in staffing his office and getting people to come, you know, to work in his office is that he keeps on asking millionaires to come in and people who without public service experience, and they get there and they realize exactly how much they have to divest themselves off and, um, and they can't do it and they walk away. Or, um, was it Scaramucci who, one of my students was claiming that Scaramucci's um, short tenure uh, was basically aimed at 
um, selling all of his stock, all of his interests in companies um, tax-free because you can actually sell tax-free. If you're going to work for the government, you, you sell and you don't have to pay the penalty of, of taxes that you'd have to pay if you were just getting, uh, selling things ordinarily. Um, and somebody said that Scaramucci had planned to do that, that he was divesting himself of all these uh, stocks without having to pay taxes. Um, apparently he didn't sign on the dotted line quite fast enough, so he wasn't able to do that, but because uh, he was only in there for 10 days or something? Right, he wasn't supposed to have started yet, and he, so he hadn't gotten rid of all of these uh, these stocks. So, but that is a problem. So, other members of the of the um, administration have had uh, have been required to do that according to um, various, not the constitution, but uh, statutes. I think so. See, I think it's everybody else. Yeah, but like cabinet le level for sure, and then maybe a I little below. I think. And mm. She is. She doesn't even have a job at this point. She has an office. Yeah. I think she has an office, but not a paid but, job. But Jared Kushner has a paid job, and I. Mm. And so how? And he co-owns those interests mm. and hasn't signed it over. Hmm. Interesting. Know. That would be something that someone could ask Chase Cushman if anyone's doing informational interviews with Chase Cushman at any point. Chase Cushman is a, uh, an alum who worked as, and he got to that level, he got to the director level. I'm sure he didn't have any stocks or anything because <laughs> he worked straight out of St. John's for the Obama administration, but um, I think that would be interesting to ask if you get to the level of being a director of a department at in the administration, do you have to pay, do you have to divest? Mm -hmm. Interesting. See, these things we don't know. Someone find out. Come and tell me. Thank you both so much for coming today. I have two questions. Um, my first one is going back to what you said, Professor Haig, that you are very optimistic about how students are becoming more politically engaged. And I was wondering what you think is the most effective way for students to become politically politically engaged to ensure that Donald Trump is not, President Trump is not reelected. And I totally recognize that this is a partisan question. So, but my advice would be for both Republicans and Democrats. Um, so get involved with the parties on campus, the campus Democrats, campus Republicans, um, the college Republicans, sorry. Uh, and, and work that way. Um, there are many uh, people who are running for state and local. Sometimes it's really difficult, like, oh, well, there's not a presidential election until 2020, but there's elections next year, and those campaigns have started already, and um, some of those campaigns are local, and those local campaign campaigns will involve get out the vote drives, and um, turnout is a, an amazing thing, and, and you should all go and volunteer for those various campaigns. Um, and there are many people, uh, there are many ways of doing that. You can just contact uh, your local college Republican, college Dem, and say, I'd like to work on a campaign. And that would be awesome. So there's, uh, and there's all sorts of campaigns. So read up on the various candidates and see who you'd like to work for and why. Um, and, and, um, and those elections are all coming up, so do that. Do you have a better answer? No. Okay. Thank you. And then I was also wondering if you both could speak on the Muslim ban. Um, it was a very painful day for myself, and I'm wondering how, um, what constitutional power President Trump has to do this, and also um, what role the courts could have, specifically the Supreme Court, in overruling this. Thank you. you know, you. that's a really good question, and you know, just to trace out this history a little bit, you know, I think then everyone knows that Trump became president and then he imposed this travel ban uh, uh, from people traveling from a set of majority Muslim countries. Um, then that was immediately challenged in court. 
and uh, some federal district courts and courts of appeals said that that was unconstitutional. And I'll talk about the unconstitutionality in a little bit. Then President Trump revised that ban so that it did not then affect people who already had uh, uh, visas to travel from those countries. Then some courts of appeals uh, said that also was unconstitutional. Then the US Supreme Court at the end of June said, okay, we're accepting an appeal now to be scheduled in the fall on that travel ban. And in the meantime, they said most features of that travel ban would be allowed to go into effect. Um, see, and you can now see how things have shifted a little bit. Because remember when I talked about the 14th Amendment, it's sort of like it protects any person from a deprivation of a liberty. So those visa holders were persons that then were potentially deprived of, of their right to travel. But now enough time has passed that uh, now the travel ban is essentially just stopping people from applying for a visa. And, and that's really the travel ban that has gone into effect at this point. So the so this case is being heard in early October, so in a month at the US Supreme Court. And the following thing has now occurred. And now this occur this also sounds legally very detailed, but it's actually very legally relevant, which is the travel ban was imposed for six months. And actually, by the end of October, that six months will have expired. So this sounds really odd, but it's completely possible that the Supreme Court is going to say, well, there is, we use the term, the case is now moot because the travel ban is no longer in effect unless Trump sort of reimposes it. But you notice then that's like a different case. I want people just kind of like mentally prepared for, I think this is like a really likely scenario that the Supreme Court will hear the case, say the case is then moot, which in some ways makes the entire case disappear at both the Supreme Court level and all of the federal court decisions that have come before, then Trump could in some ways establish a new ban, but then that would be a new case. Really weird, but completely possible. That's my complicated con law answer. Perfect. Well, out of respect for uh, those trying to catch the 615 bus, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Dr. Hag and Dr. Cronenbush for speaking with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody.